Okay, next I'd like to call up um, one of our most important resources. It's the Air Raid Reef. And here, next we have Richard Stedman. Richard is the Air Pollution Control Officer for the Monterey Bay Area Air Resources. And from January 2001 to 2009, Richard has served as Executive Director for the Olympic uh, Regional Clear Air Agency in Washington State and many other agencies. So I'd like to invite Richard up. Please, Richard. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, I'd like to especially thank Levon for the invitation. And I, I want to tell a story about Levon and uh, show how small a world this is. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I used to work uh, for the Agency of Toxic Substances and Disease Registry up in in um, Washington State. And when I first came down to Monterey, uh, I got a call from one of my old colleagues up there, and they said, well, you must know Levon Stone then. And they were in Atlanta. And I said, I haven't had the pleasure, and I, I swear, the next day, Levon called me. And she wanted to talk about all the issues that were going on with um, the, the burns that occur at Fort Ord uh, for the unexploded munitions cleanup. So, uh, lo and behold, she's got a national reputation. And then I also would like to say that two years ago, uh, my agency, the Monterey Bay Air Resources District, we give out clean air awards every year, and we actually gave Lamont an award um, a couple of years ago for her leadership. She's a tireless advocate for clean air and for public health, and she's certainly a, 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 a definitely a treasure for the area. So. Um, she really helps keep Thank people you. honest, and uh, she's she's made my job. <laughs> made my job a little more difficult, but uh, I think uh, in all honesty, we need folks like Levon and this group uh, to keep people honest and keep them moving in the right direction. So um, I don't have a lot to say except for. Um, I, I did have a film, but I, I, let's forget the film. It just talks about what air agencies do. But um, similar to what the mission statement is for Fort Ord Environmental Justice Network, we have a similar one for our air agency. And it's basically, it says, we protect air quality and environmental health while balancing economic considerations. So um, if we were the total air quality agency that was all about protecting public health, We'd shut down the power plant. You guys wouldn't have electricity, or somebody wouldn't have electricity in the state. Uh, we wouldn't allow gas stations to refuel vehicles. Uh, we could be very, we're not an agency that's all about shutting people down. We're actually an agency that's all about permitting folks to basically dump things into the air, but we want to make sure they do it in the most healthful way possible. So whenever a new uh, air pollution source, such as a business, such as a power plant, dry cleaner, uh, gas station, that sort of thing, comes online, they come to us to get a permit, and we make sure they're doing and using the best available air pollution control technology possible. And that way we can help minimize impacts to the environment and of course public health. So with respect to uh, Ford Ord, uh, they have basically zero to six days per year that they can burn out there. And um, I know I see uh, Lamont's petitioning Camila Harris to shut down burning altogether. Um, we fought the good fight with Ford Ord. My agency actually is sued uh, Ford Ord. Uh, back in the past, before I got here seven uh, years ago, uh, there were some really tumultuous times where Ford Ord just, just to torched things off without any regard for wind direction, without regard for public health. Um, so uh, we've inserted ourselves into the process now where they don't get permission to burn unless we tell them it's okay. And that's why I say there's zero to six days per year. The last few years they have not been able to burn because conditions have not been right. So um, imagine having 365 days where between, they can only burn between July and October, and then we get into a, a, a difficult time too when we have fire danger. And one thing I want to say, somebody brought it up earlier, is that, um, you know, we have climate change that's happening. And if, if you don't believe in it, I assume most, most people here uh, trust science and what it has to say. It's not subject to your personal belief system. It's actually occurring. 
And one of the things, the dirty little secrets of California is tree mortality. Because of the drought that we've had, which is probably a direct result of climate change, we have in some areas 20 to 50% of our forests are dead or dying. So what does that mean? So that's a bummer. Somebody said, you know, drought's a problem. It is a problem. But it's only going to get worse because those trees are going to combust. They are going to catch on fire. And we are going to have some really bad air quality. Um, we have some of the best air quality in the nation, um, on, on, according to our monitoring system. Salinas, where one of our monitors is located, is typically in the top 10 uh, clean air um, monitors in the country. And that's not us saying that, that's the American Lung Association that reviews our monitoring data. So um, what I'm going to tell you is probably not going to be very good to hear, but uh, similar to what's happening at Fort Ord, we may have uh, a serious burn that takes place here that's unplanned, that's not managed, and takes out a lot of this property, which could be weeks, if not months, of burning. Uh, there's a lot of area here that, that hasn't burned, and what we see is fuel burns up. We have a really dry situation now with the drought. We got some good rains this last year, but it still hasn't really uh, righted the ship, so to speak. So we're looking to really bad air quality in the area. You can see that when we've had even uh, fires in uh, Big Sur, there's fire going on there right now. Um, typically what will happen is we'll see the, the air mass will get pushed out to sea and then backed into Carmel Valley and the Peninsula cities and our monitors go off. And there's not much that an air agency can do to regulate wildfires except for uh, make sure that People get the message not to burn and to be fire safe during these uh, really dry periods of time, especially in our drought. And of course, what's the other problem? We don't have water. Water is uh, something that we really need to control fires, to control dust. The ag uh, operations in our South County area contribute to a lot of our air pollution issues because we have a lot of wind and we have a lot of um, uh, tractors. I, I don't know if any of you have ever driven 101 and seen people plowing the fields, especially when it's so windy. You'll see the topsoil just blowing over in San Luis Obispo. It's pretty crazy. So we do not meet the uh, state, uh, federal standards for particulate matter uh, or dust um, in, in the South County. So that's something the agency is really working on. We do regulate the berms at Fort Ord. Uh, we have uh, vested staff, a meteorologist that work with the Army, but as I said, uh, they can't burn unless we say they can burn, and um, we typically have very strict prescriptions for uh, the occasion to burn. So, as I said, they haven't been being, in the last five years or so, they've only burned a couple of times. It's um, doubtful, I'll, I'll say this, I could be wrong, but it's doubtful, first of all, <laughs> It's doubtful that they're going to burn uh, this this year. I could be wrong, but one of the uh, parameters is fire resources. And so they cannot set off a fire here unless they have adequate backup. Uh, and that's throughout the state. And uh, because of the fire dangers and the many fires that I think we're going to be fighting as the, as the summer goes forward, um, I don't think there's going to be adequate resources to be here. The other thing about Fort Ord, which is really unique, if they have a fire that occurs outside of the area where they prescribed for the burn, uh, it's not like they can just drive on site and start putting it out with fire engines. It's because they have unexploded ordnance all over the place, and if they drive the trucks out there, they could explode or they could be um, uh, seriously injured. So you'll see these guys, last time they burned, they did have an uh, escape and went beyond their prescribed area. And the, they brought in a lot of helicopters to put out the fire, but those are very expensive and they can only pick up a certain amount of water at a time. And they had the fire truck sitting on this outside with cannons of water trying to reach the fire, but they couldn't drive on to protect the uh, resources. So we did see some uh, uh, issues. But typically, uh, what we like to see is we like to see really good uplift. That means it gets the uh, materials out of the area and um, away from a populated area. Well, some of the biggest problems we have is when we call the smolter phase, 
is when uh, that hot air, uh, the, the fire basically generates a weather. Um, uh, when it smolders down and cools off, then it, it hugs the ground and we see spillover on the 68 and sometimes in the marina area. So that's a problem. Uh, we haven't uh, solved any way to deal with that except for once again to make sure that we've got good handle on what uh, air quality and the weather is going to be. We do a lot. We use radio sonars. We, we launch weather balloons. We work with the naval uh, weather folks at the um, Navy uh, postgraduate school. So we employ a lot of resources around these burns. And we try to be as protectful to public health as possible. We also deploy a lot of monitoring stations at sensitive areas such as schools, hospitals, and residential areas. So um, we're, we're trying to do the good fight there. Um, but it's, it's not a question of whether or not they can burn. They can burn, but we feel like we have adequate control most of the time to determine when that time will occur uh, for burning. And like I said, I, I, I think it's going to be doubtful that they'll burn this year. Uh, so uh, you can breathe a sigh of relief for those that are totally opposed to the burn. But I should just say this, chaparral burns, the fire cycle for reseeding itself uh, is 10 to 40 years. Um, so we'll see a build up of fuels and then we even get lightning strikes that set this stuff off. So there was one school of thought that says, well, if they can control the burns, then we shouldn't have a conflagration or a huge wildfire over the next uh, uh, number of years. So uh, that's a huge debate, but we do look at a lot of uh, the factors going on and we feel like we're being as protective of public health as we can be, short of banning all fires. Um, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop talking, but um, once again, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Ron and the Brown Environmental Justice Network for this opportunity to come out. And I'll be around for another hour or so, so if folks have questions, they can certainly come talk to me. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Very important. Never take our clean air for granted, huh? Okay, next I'd like to introduce you um, to a man who uh, comes to us from Salinas. Uh, I guess it would say persistence beats resistance in your case? Troublemaker. Well, <laughs> all right, so we'll call it just be persistent. Um, in this political environment, I'm sure your message will resonate. So, uh, well, any further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Mary Oil candidate from Salinas, Amit Pendia. Pendia. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Come on up and uh, meet the people. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'll be brief, tell you a little bit about my background and some of the causes and what I think. Uh, next two to four, six years should look like. I have always been branded troublemaker for the last 15 years by the city of Salinas. And there's a reason. Back six years ago, when talking about homeless was not kosher, I was up against the city council as the president of Old Town Salinas Association, asking them to help fix the homeless problem. We got brushed off to the county of Monterey. This is not a city of Salinas problem. We have $10,000 to deal with the homeless issue. So nothing we can do. Last year, city of Salinas spent $2.1 million to help solve the homeless issue, which is a huge step up from $10,000 six years ago. But they don't know how to fix the homeless issue. They don't know how to make it the problem any better. They just displaced the poor homeless <coughs> who were in the Chinatown by taking a bulldozer and taking all their properties. They moved away. Now instead of being in a central place that where they could be taken care of and fed, they're in 20, 30, 40 encampments and they're being persecuted. To me, environmental justice has a lot to do because everything I see, everything I touch is in my environment. Yes. It's not just the water, 
And it's not just the air, it is also the pesticides and poisons which are in the air. And I'm part of a group called SAS, S A A S, Safe Ad Safe School. UC Berkeley has done 19 years of research in California that identifies the fact that certain pesticides have propensity to cause asthma, increased rates of cancer, learning disabilities, and so on and so forth. I would like you to guess for a second where they go in California to get their data and environmental information and parts per million on chemical spraying. Salinas. Right here in Salinas. 19 years, we have known. This group has tried and worked hard. Juan Martinez is a leading member of that group as well. We have worked hard to establish a safe zone around the schools. That if you're gonna spray pesticides, methyl bromide, which is now out of production, but peptides and 10 other things, that you make sure that my kids are not harmed. That you give us a buffer zone. A quarter mile, half mile, one mile, whatever scientifically is proven to reduce the risk of cancers and asthma and learning disabilities. Because this is not just about the pesticides and big agriculture, folks. This is about health and safety of our entire generation that is in the schools at this point. Environmental justice comes to forefront when Cynthia Salinas on a homeless issue takes bulldozers, takes all the properties, and when the homeless advocates go sit with the mayor and the council and the city manager and says, here you are taking out over 300 people, nine of them are pregnant, eight of them have families and kids under 10. Where do you suppose they go? We have no place for them to go. They can go wherever. This came a week after city council made an announcement at their council meeting, their city is reserving a one acre plot on the north side of Salinas to turn that into a dog park. Yes. So we asked the city leadership face to face right across the table, you have one acre for the dog park, can you cut that in half and give my homeless half an acre? So they can safely fish the tents while you figure out your temporary housing situation. The answer was no. Not even a square inch for our homeless while the city gives a whole acre to the dog park. Something is wrong, not only with our leadership, but us, when we take this kind of injustice right. and don't speak up against yes. it. Yes. 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 And I know time is tight, I could go on and on. I, I'm, I'm kind of shy at this microphone, but... <laughs> yeah, you're right, you can tell. <laughs> so, the bottom line is, if we don't speak up and bring issues to our leadership, if we don't unite and have a strong voice, then the leadership is free to do what yes. it is that they want to do. The Constitution starts with the word, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union. Yes. This government is by the people, and it should be for the people. And this environmental racism that goes on with pesticides and so on and so forth, and I use the word racism selectively, because the majority of the schools around which the pesticides are spread and applied are of Mexican persuasion. And all these atrocities that are happening, if we, the people, don't unite, if we don't come together in forums like this, thank you for making this happen, and if we don't take our fight to the streets, and come November, we don't put the right people in the right place because, ah, I forgot to vote, or it's too inconvenient, yes. then that is no longer an excuse that we can hide behind. Democracy, is a full contact sport. Yes. It is not a spectator sport. You cannot sit on the sidelines and watch it happen. Right. So that, that is where we are. Thank you very much. All right. All right.
safety, accountability, transparency, and after school programs, and crime prevention programs. Okay, good luck on your candidacy, huh? Thank you, sir. All right. And uh, we'll get the word out. Okay? appreciate it. Okay, next I'd like to uh, ask Mr. Reed to give a few words. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Stones have been on my case to be more involved in the community. <laughs> Right. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Frank Reed, I um, don't hail from these quarters, I, I come from the Midwest, spent a lot of time in the District of Columbia, as well as Minneapolis and Boston, but I, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, the Stones have been at my heels to, to be more active, particularly Mr. Stone, <laughs> whom I love, and so I'm here to, to, to make a statement, although I feel like my thunder has been taken from me a little bit. <laughs> from what other people have said before me. Uh, I am a lawyer. I've practiced for many, many years. Uh, I've been a prosecutor. I've been a, a defense attorney. Me too. I have uh, uh, worked in many municipalities. I have absolutely, uh, absolutely rent, uh, I represented uh, police officers and police brutality cases, if you can believe that. I have done the other side on those cases as well. Um, so I have seen a lot, maybe too much, but, but still loving uh, with a big heart and still trying to do the right thing. But um, the one thing that, that really plays in my mind right now as I, I stand here before you is through it all, all the things that I've done, all the things that I have seen, we can talk about the agencies, um, that I've worked for and that other people here on the panel have, have worked for and the things that they have done is that at the end of the day it's all about the human aspect. We talk about all the, the policies, the, the legislation, the thing that goes on in the boardrooms, things that happen um, at the Capitol, in D.C. as well here in Sacramento. Um, it's the human aspect that has to be addressed. That has to be the core of whatever it is that we talk about. Because if we lose sight of that, our decision making never changes. We still forget about those homeless folks that are on the street. Yes. Yes. We still forget about those people that are the result of brutality. Yes. They're yes. out there and uh, our elected officials forget about them. Yes. Yes. All of that stuff goes to the side unless we keep the human aspect of who yes. we are at the core of the discussion. Um, but the one thing there too is that We've forgotten, I think, how to address that. Yes. And if we forget how to address that, then at the end of the day, uh, it's on us. <coughs> it's on us. Thank you. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. Ecology um, is a radical word 
because it implies relationship, thriving, and mutuality. Um, it says that multiple parts of the system are needed for healthy functioning. And what I call the ecological society places water pollution or air pollution right alongside racial and economic justice and helps us value all parts of those systems. And what we've learned from ecology is that the aspects of the system that are the most imperiled are the most important. And focusing care and attention on them makes the system whole again. So the individuals and communities suffering the most environmental and social harms turn out to be the most important to the well-being of society as a whole. We all know this intuitively, but ecology expresses this idea very well. And for me, this has helped to bring the ideas of social and earth justice back into one concept. It is important to you to reflect on what the natural world has to offer. When we're besieged by problems, it's really easy to lose our connection to the land and its support for our well-being. And the time has come um, for the precious healing space of the beautiful, green, open, natural world to be available and enjoyed by every child, parent, and grandparent of every race, religion, and economic level, everyone. Because research has shown that the natural world, trees, plants, rivers, wilderness, gardens, and parks, is vital to our well-being. Being connected to nature, research has shown, helps us to live longer and healthier lives, pay attention, it addresses ADD symptoms, experience mental health, reduces depression, learn, be creative, even generous, more generous, and happy. So protecting the environment is a radical act in our own best interest. Um, thinking and acting with an ecological society in mind can bring justice for both people on the earth. This is a world in which we preserve every possible acre of open wild space. We support every environmental restoration project that we can. We work to support causes like anti-fracking that protects our water and air, while at the same time putting our whole hearts and minds, at the same time putting our whole hearts and minds into making our cities connected and diverse to nourish our souls, address disparities, build job programs, address homelessness, and meet the needs of everyone equitably and creatively. We do not have to sacrifice ourselves or the environment in this ecological view, because both are essential. And we put the system at risk when we ignore one or the other. To me, this is environmental justice. We also need to expand our sense of community, and a lot of people have talked about this today. Um, we all know that we should work together, but it is not always easy or apparent how to do this. Fighting battles alone, as individuals or even as single organizations, is tiring. It can be disappointing and even ineffective. But community provides support and belonging, it builds confidence, vision, and endurance that are required um, for the long haul. And where communities come together, creative ideas are born, like today, and energy is created. Community helps us also to share the workload and challenges us to be the best we can and offers us relationships built on love and truth. Because we truth tell, right, when we're in community? So we need to improve on this. Um, so in our quest for an equitable world, how do we expand our ties? Um, by forging relationships outside of the boxes that we're in right now, by being open-hearted and demonstrating the future we want to have. So let's get out of the boxes. First off, let's acknowledge that we all share in the community of the land. This is our primary community that everyone shares. Here on this place on Fort Ord in the surrounding landscapes is where we are making our homes, sending our children to school, gardening, growing old. This land and our nearby ocean hold us and nurture us. They clean our air and our water, they soothe our minds, stir poets and artists. <coughs> set the seasons, and work with us to face into climate change. The earth is doing this with us. So not only do we need to protect this land, our home, and the home of our children, we need to forge relationship with it.
to bring it into the circle of our connected community, whether it's a walk along the beach, a bike ride at Fort Ord, gardening. The land is here to inspire and heal us, and we are here for the land. This is our common space. We also expand human community by expanding our collaborations, by engaging in justice making with more people than we have in the past. We have our families and social ties and our faith communities. We have books and the company of justice seekers from the past and present to teach us um, and inspire us. So who else can collaborate with us? Going forward, we have the opportunity to build alliances beyond these familiar communities and organizations. We can forge ties with diverse individuals and communities that are also working for justice. Hispanic, Native American, Asian, LGBTQI, Black Lives Matter, veteran, Muslim, differently abled, peace and justice groups, sustainability groups, political action groups, social service organizations, environmental organizations, racial and social justice organizations. If we work together more intentionally, we will make friends and form relationships that will move our work forward. If everyone here in this room created two new community ties by becoming a member or endorsing an organization, communicating our support or inviting a partnership, creating a partnership, Think of how the connectedness just in this room would increase. Um, we have potential friendships everywhere. So my question is, um, what are two ways that you can increase your connectedness and your community when we leave here today? Two new ways. I'm going to become a member of my local garden club and invite a collaboration between Communities for Sustainable Monterey County and the Fort Hurt Environmental Justice Network. Those are the two ways that I'm going to increase my community. Oh, right. That's cool. Another way to enlarge community is to open up heart space um, to build platforms for reconciliation. And um, as a white person, I really feel the need to say this. White people need to do their work around racism, privilege, and power. It is a lifetime of ongoing work, as you can imagine. It is long overdue. It is humbling, it is vulnerable, but it must be done uh, for a whole and just society to emerge for, all, emerge for all of us. And in that work, uh, white people will learn that we need to offer up the happenstance of our own power, knowledge, safety, privilege, resources, access, respect, and confidence to the service of others. We learn that we must tell the truth and legislate and work to end disparities of power and rights that have defined society and so deeply damaged people and the natural world. I see this as my work and I am open to having my perspective widened and challenged as loving people in my life correct and educate me about my own racism and privilege. This is my part and there are many ways to open up heart space and build bridges between people of many backgrounds. Another way, the last way, um, I want to speak about creating community is by holding out for the future we want to have so that others are drawn to our message. This means allowing a vision to grow and transforming our expectations of what the future can be. Sometimes we get so brought down by problems, we lose our ability to dream the future into being. Everyone has their own way of dealing with trauma, loss, oppression, anger, and pain, and this is legitimate and right in our society. Yet I also believe that everyone has a secret hope for the world. Yes. It is hard to understand, it is hard work to understand the possibilities that can emerge for our world. It is vulnerable. It takes courage to shine a light on the way forward. But when we do, people are drawn to the light. It is powerful work to hold out a healing vision for the world, and it builds community. So for a society that combines earth and human justice, we need to get creative, expand our definition of community and those links, build bridges, and live from a visionary place. Let's deepen our relationship with the natural world so it can nurture and support our communities and bless us with its bounty and care. 
Let's widen our circles of alliance across boundaries, breaking the walls that have divided us, asking for help, companionship, and collaboration. Let's do our work to break down divisions and dismantle racism and other injustices. And let's open up our hearts once again to a positive future that we are creating together and act for that visionary space. These are my ideas on some pathways for creating change. I'm blessed to hear many others here today. Um, building our future together is about being a genuine and straightforward person who is opening doors and making connections so we can move together into a new day. Um, the schedule changed for today and it was anticipated that I might be able to um, briefly speak about the handout that came to you. Um, so I'm just going to mention it really quickly. Is that okay, Lavon? Unless you want to have after lunch. What, I'll do whatever you want. Yeah, we wanted you After to. lunch? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Give her a hand. That was a very courageous and heartfelt, oh my God, talk. And I Thanks, hope Karen. that we can really uh, keep going. Karen, you have something in the jar. Would you like to share it with oh, us? Oh, yeah, please? it's a big poop. No. What? It's carbon. Oh. It's cleaning the water. It's a carbon filter. We need it. We need that. Yeah. So, it does look like a big poop. Okay, I think we have time for uh, two more panelists before lunch. Do we? We're hungry. Okay. We're going to bring up uh, to your colleagues. Well, she Well, I was, I was wanting to invite the, uh, your two colleagues, uh, well, Janet well, and... Uh, they, can, they can wait down there once. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Can't you? Can't you? <laughs> we got it. Yeah. Then we'll yield the floor to... They know their stars. Miss <laughs> Beattie. Yeah. And Nina is a long-time Monterey resident and a community advocate. She's a writer and a public speaker on the environment and health topics. Good afternoon. I guess it's afternoon now. Um, standing issue been going on since 2011 and it's impacting us here in Monterey Bay. It's uh, tinyurl.com slash Fukushima history. And they have gone through, and this is, this is better actually, if it's okay. I'd rather use it. That's fine. That's fine. Um, so, and those are um, uh, two really good websites. Uh, Sorry, I'm not used to using this computer, so I'm, I'm having a little difficulty with the, uh, with the interface here. I thought it would be easier to have a um, a, uh, some of these uh... well until this it's 
Excuse me. Let me give you some background on Fukushima. Yes, thank you. Um, the, uh, the situation happened in March of 2011. It's gone out of the news media. Um, but what happened is there was an earthquake, an incredibly powerful earthquake. It knocked the power, the power grid down um, in Japan. And the first effect, they'll talk about the tsunami, they'll talk about a lot of issues. But what happened was that the, uh, the power was, dis was disconnected to the nuclear power plant. What most people don't understand is that nuclear power plants rely on grid power. If the power goes away, they have to rely on backup generators to keep the uh, fuel cores, uh, the, the, the cores of the reactors cool, to keep the spent fuel pools cool. That's all dependent on grid power. If the grid power goes away and the backup generators fail, we're in deep trouble. And what happens is that these generators are adapted from cruise ships and they're, um, they're geared to come on slowly, to warm up, not to come on at full speed, not to last for days, if need be, if the power is down. They're typically not maintained. And what happened to Fukushima and happens potentially at power plants, nuclear power plants anywhere, is that when they were turned on, at least two of them broke. And that's what precipitated this whole disaster at Fukushima, is the generators broke, now the temperature's rising in the fuel cores, and in the reactors, and in the spent fuel pools. And they were starting to, to go ballistic, basically, before the tsunami hit. And then the tsunami hit and caused additional problems. But what we had is we had this earthquake, and uh, this is the former uh, Prime Minister, who was Prime Minister during this time, says this is the most severe accident in the history of mankind. We never hear that from anyone. And I'll show you some quotes from some people locally that, that, uh, that talk about this. So the power failure, the generators failed, there was overheating. There was also, because of the, the, the huge earthquake, there was water loss from the spent fuel pools. They're covered with water. They have to be covered with water. If they're exposed to air, they burst into flames, they explode. So what happened then is you had, because of the water loss, because of the overheating, you had explosions of the reactors and the spent fuel pools, and then you had meltdowns of three reactors. This is just Fukushima. There is information coming out, and there's been a virtual news blackout in Japan over a lot of this. Slowly, information comes out, and it's with a great deal of pushing. But the, um, there may have been other reactors that also melted down. Um, we don't know. Um, there are some indications, but people really have to do detective work, and there's a new state secrets law in Japan that you can be thrown in prison for, re for revealing information, and they, many people believe in Japan that this was instituted because of the Fukushima disaster. So doctors are in fear of losing their licenses and actually going to prison for telling patients their children may be sick because of the radiation, and journalists can go to jail for talking about Fukushima, they can be thrown out of their jobs. It's a very, very bad situation. This is what it looked like. Two of the pictures that we saw but I think there were far more that we didn't see. Unit 1 going up, Unit 2 going up. It's much more than just these visuals. The spent fuel pools are where the fuel rods go. It gets really, really hot in the, in the whole thing of nuclear generation. And so when they're not longer, no longer usable, because they become so hot, they go into these spent fuel pools to be cooled down over years, and eventually they can be packed into storage. Um, but it takes years of cooling before they get to that point. This is what happened to the spent fuel pools. Um, they actually aerosolized. They became vaporized. They became vapor. Um, of Unit 2, there are four, there are actually six reactors at Fukushima Daiichi. Unit 2, 25% of the fuel vaporized. Number 3, 50%. And number 4, 100% of the spent fuel vaporized. That means it's in the environment now. We're breathing it in Japan. <coughs> it was worldwide. I don't know if you can see this. This is from, um, this 
is from USGS, US Geological Survey, and this shows the, the um, fallout as it was coming from all these explosions and, and everything that's coming towards the US. This is um, just from Reactor 1, the release. Um, the top is in black, where the arrow is, is the California coastline. Um, NOAA's chart shows um, from Japan to, and actually where that arrow is, is right Monterey Bay. I don't know if they intended that, but that's what it is. UC Berkeley, um, this is a statement that we're getting in the press and still getting in the press. Uh, nuclear engineers at UC Berkeley said, don't be alarmed. Um, these particles are so small they pose no threat at all. In 2013, they're saying there's not going to be a problem here. Now, this is from the, new, the director of the Oak Ridge National Lab in 1973. These are the amounts, if you can, again, so I apologize. The first element's plutonium-239. 16 thousandths of a gram is lethal if it's ingested in the lungs. Strontium-90 which has a half-life of 30 years. That means it's sticking around in full potency, you know, for that time, and then it still has a life after that. 20 mil, 70 millionths of a gram is lethal. Iodine-131 is 30 billionths of a gram. In Berkeley on the 23rd um, of, 2000, of March 2011, Iodine-131 in rainwater was 543 picocuries per liter. The federal Drinking water standard is three. So that's about, I think it's 180 yeah. times. Now, let's see if I can raise this. Now the EPA announced wisdom has, has raised drinking water standards. In 2013, they raised it from three to 81,000 picocuries per liter. So 543, it's not a matter of concern anymore. This was after Fukushima. Dilution, you'll hear lots about dilution. Dilution in the air, dilution in the water. The EPA says it's not going to be detectable because it's diluted. The only problem is the Atomic Energy Commission says dilution doesn't happen. There are streams in the ocean. There are areas of concentration. This bioaccumulates, actually, up the food chain as we eat things that are the small uh, beings of the plankton, the plants. It bioaccumulates, so actually the higher up the food chain is getting more and more and more. It's the opposite, it's almost magnification rather than dilution. The EPA said um, that, um, that the, this is a very important lab, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, Federal Laboratory. They, they detected trace amounts, no concern at the detectable level, at, at the detected level. But that was the detected level, 100. Um, millibecquerels per meter um, cubed. The thing is, that's a thousand times background levels. This isn't nothing. This is a thousand times what we were exposed to before. If it was true, if the EPA statement was true, and it was a lie. This is a scientist, Ted Ballier, from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory at a private research conference. We don't have access to a lot of these things, and his video disappeared off the internet after this was posted. He says, we've never ever seen anything like this. The concentrations went up and up and up. It was amazing to see this 7,000 kilometers away, and it persisted for weeks, and it filled the northern hemisphere, and it went into the southern hemisphere. Very high count rates at these detectors, consistent with a one megaton atmospheric detonation. That's how high it was. These are not trace amounts. The peak concentration was 45,000 millibecquerels per meter cubed. That's 450,000 times background levels. And the EPA said it was only 100. So you cannot count on anything the EPA says regarding this. Shortly after Fukushima, Canada stopped their radiation monitoring um, until further notice. The EPA shut down their monitoring in May, and they reverted to quarterly readings. Daniel Hirsch, again, I, um, I, if it helps, I'll just read this from my thing rather than show you, but some of the graphics um, may be visible on the screen. Um, he said he was, he, 
Daniel Hirsch is a, <coughs> a lecturer at UCSC, a nuclear expert, a director of the committee to bridge the gap. He says, I'm horrified. It seems to be the pattern that they're making sure that no one gets any measurements that have any meaning. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission on their website, this is um, to, uh, this was updated January 20, 2015, and I downloaded the information um, in January. He said, the facts, bottom line, the low levels of radiation leaking into the ocean fall well short of posing any U.S. health or environmental risk. It will not affect U.S. public health. There are only trace amounts of this isotope, and I think they were talking about iodine-131, in levels far below drinking water levels, well, which we now know is alterable, and they're actually, EPA is talking about altering drinking water levels again. The air issues ongoing from the plant include, and this is, this is what people don't understand about Fukushima because the news media is not talking about it. There are ongoing emissions from the plant and sometimes high levels of iodine-131. That indicates there's ongoing fission going on at the plant. They don't know where the cores are. The cores have burrowed through the containment vessels into the earth. They could be 100 kilometers below the surface, still fissioning, still um, uh, creating iodine-131 as well as these other radioactive elements. They are burning the debris when they're cleaning up all the houses and everything. Then they're burning it, and Japan actually trucked the debris so that all Japanese people would bear the burden. They trucked it all over the country. Protests. Uh, Japanese people, are, and generally, I, I understand from, from the news reports, is that they have not historically been a great protesting people. They're protesting about this a lot. And they truck this debris all over the place, burning it, and so it doesn't just go there, it goes all over the world. The, the emissions from Fukushima, I think it's every 13 day circle of planet. Um, the pollen is radioactive, that goes everywhere. Um, this is a, again, it was cut off. This is the new censorship. This is the Ida 131 in Tokyo sewage. Now Tokyo is 120 miles away from Fukushima Daiichi. So I've seen the amounts that's in the, the province, the area around Fukushima. It's, it's much greater than this, but it keeps going up and up. Now Ida 131 only has a half-life of eight days. So where is this coming from? It's coming from the ongoing stuff and probably from the other, the other things. Um, I'm going to skip through some of this. Um, this is that the one? I want, this is the California Department of Public Health. This is our health department in the state. There's no public health risk on the beaches from radioactivity. Um, but the water contamination is, um, we're now, today is the 1,961st day of multiple sources of radioactive water pouring into the Pacific Ocean. Um, they, the, the site is over a river, um, an underground river, and the melt throughs, um, the water comes out and it's contaminated. Um, there are many, many rivers in the region, it's a watershed, um, and Japan is dumping water. They've been pouring, trying to keep work, these cores are cool, and that water is highly contaminated, and they've been storing it, now they're dumping it, and um, TEPCO admits to 400 tons a day that are going into the Pacific Ocean, but it's probably closer to 1,000, but no one knows. It's never been leak. The Pacific currents come right from Japan right to us. This is one of the studies modeling. It only showed the initial meltdown. It does not, oh, darn. The, it, this massive thing coming through a cesium but it doesn't, this is only from the initial meltdown, not from the subsequent stuff. There are many charts. Um, I want to just focus, just touch on briefly that the rain in um, Monterey, I measured it three times um, during the winter, and the rain was three times background levels of uh, radiation on the Geiger counter. Um, when it rains, use an umbrella. Um, some people even keep their rain gear out of the house because of the radioactivity. If you have pets and they walk outside, walk, make sure that you wash their feet, um, particularly when it's raining. But the fallout is constant. Let me tell you, it is constant. Um, if you have rain barrels for the garden, um, test the water. Um, your, your rain barrel could hold strontium, plutonium, um, americium, uh, polonium. 
iodine 129, which is a long lasting one, cesium. And change, if you have bird baths for water, uh, bird baths for, for the birds, change the water frequently, especially if after it rains, get rid of that water and put in fresh water. Um, hot particles are something that's, again, this aerosolized thing, it latches on the lung tissue. We're going to see an increase in non smoking lung cancer. Um, and that's just going to be a fact of life. Excuse me. Well, is the government doing any? First of all, you just ruined my opinion trip. So, is the government doing to curb some of it? Are they developing some kind of soil or something to kind of curb this? No, I think there are um, there are um, some uh, groups that are trying innovative uh, neutralization techniques, um, but at this point, for instance, the situation in Japan, there is there's no technological fix at this point, and um, one of the things they could do is be warning the public uh, about the food contamination, for instance, but. Um, they're not doing that. They're continuing to say it's everything's safe, everything's fine, there's no problem. In fact, Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, signed an agreement to allow the continued importation of, of food and products from Japan, um, knowing full well that this is massively contaminated. Okay. Um, other countries are doing okay. that. Well, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's after 1 o'clock, and she will come back after lunch. Uh, you can see that every topic that's been spoken of here is vitally important and, and that the area each person is working in is vitally important. Unfortunately, we can't get all the information out today. We're going to have a part two. We're going to have a focus group. And anybody that's, that's concerned about any of these topics will have a chance to join these focus groups, even if it's two or three people. So this is just giving you some tidbits as to what is going on in the community. And we all have to acknowledge that every last one of them is important. And so, uh, and I would respect for the people that's going to uh, present after lunch. Let's have our half an hour lunch and get back, and then we can go, go on. All right? Uh, excuse me, when I say the grace of God, we, we ask you to bless this food without uh, any impurities and anything that will cause harm to the body. Let it be for nourishment. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.